Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> we'll begin in a minute or so. I think it would be a good time to uh, begin the proceedings. My okay. name is Gus uh, Van Harten. I'll be uh, chairing the discussion on ecocide today. Uh, but before I say more about our guests and participants in the discussion, I'd like to turn the screen over to uh, Barnali, my colleague Barnali Chowdhury, as director of the Nathanson Center, in case you'd like to offer some introductory remarks, Barnali. Oh, thank you very much, Gus. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us here today at this uh, wonderful event on uh, understanding the legal definition of ecocide. I'd like to begin by um, reading a land acknowledgement. So Osgoode Hall Law School acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takrano has been caretaken by the Ashinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders and the Mississaugas of the new Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampoon Belt Covenant and Agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Now, thanks everybody for joining us for this great presentation. I'm just gonna give a brief introduction to our panelists before we begin. So we have the immense pleasure of having not only an environmental lawyer today, but also an international criminal lawyer today. So our panelists are uh, Christina Voigt first, who is a professor of law at the University of Oslo in Norway. She was previously the principal legal advisor for the government of Norway in the UN climate negotiations, and she negotiated the Paris Agreement. Currently, she is the chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and co-chair of the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. Professor Voigt was also a member of the Independent Expert Panel for the Legal Definition of Ecocide. We're also joined by Daryl Robinson, who is a professor at Queen's University in Canada. He served as a legal officer at Foreign Affairs Canada, and he was the advisor to the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. He is an internationally recognized expert in international criminal law and a member of the Promise Institute Working Group on the use of international criminal law to protect the environment. So I think we're going to allow our speakers today to speak for about 30 minutes or so, or maybe we'll go slightly over before we open it up to questions. Um, so why don't we begin with uh, Professor Voigt. So Professor Voigt, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Ben Ali. Thank you, Gus, for, for your kind introduction and also for organizing this uh, academic exchange on the definition of ecocide, which was launched um, earlier this year in June. Uh, what I would like to do is I'd like to say a couple of words about how the in independent expert panel worked, a little bit of who we are and, and what united us in the end. And then I will uh, make some comments on the choices that we had before us and why we choose what we chose in the end and, and why we ended up with the definition, uh, which I will introduce in a moment. Now, the what is called the Independent Expert Panel for the Legal Definition of Ecocide was established last year. I can't quite remember when it was. It was in this uh, fog of uh, COVID uh, meetings, but it was established uh, in the second half of 2020 by the Stop Ecocide Foundation, who has for a long time promoted the um, uh, crime of ecocide to be elevated at the international level, recognized and elevated at the international level, um, previously uh, established by the late Polly Higgins and now chaired by Jojo Mehta. And Jojo invited 12 international lawyers uh, to sit on that panel, and it's an independent panel. It is um, really just a set of lawyers that work in their individual expert capacity. 
Um, and as I said, we were quite different uh, in our backgrounds and our approaches in our expertise. They were both environmental lawyers, they were international criminal lawyers, national criminal lawyers, they were diplomats, they were civil servants, academics, um, activists. So it was a really diverse group of people, also geographically um, diverse, diverse backgrounds, which made it a very intellectually interesting and, and also challenging exercise to come up with a, a definition that, that united us. And it took us about six months to deliver on the mandate, which we were given. We had many, many uh, online meetings, many exchanges by email. We've never met each other in person, which is really unfortunate, <laughs> I think, because it would have been a really interesting discussion to sit around a real table and discuss uh, and exchange our views. But that unfortunately could not happen due to the pandemic. Um, I'll say more about choices in a second, um, just to set out, there were many different options and many different choices we could have made, but by the end of the day, what uh, led us uh, to unite us in a definition is the following one, and I'm sure it's well um, known to the audience, but I'll read it out nevertheless, the panel. Um, launched the definition of ecocide on the 22nd of June this year. And the proposed definition is that for the purpose of the Rome statute, ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. There's a second paragraph, which I will not read out, and maybe it can be, yeah, but can be put in the chat so that everybody can see it, so I don't have to read it. But I just wanted to introduce that kind of chapeau type uh, general and abstract, <coughs> I'm sorry, definition that we propose. We propose it as a amend, possible amendment to the Rome Statute as a fifth international crime complementing the existing four international crimes and being something that would have to be um, amended uh, in the Rome Statute. Now it is in our understanding, what we delivered is a suggestion, is a proposal, is a tool that states, member states, the Rome Statute can use or can leave <laughs> as it is. It's just uh, a thought um, product, a knowledge product from our panel, from 12 experts that worked on it for, for six months, saying here states, if you do consider, if you want to consider ecocide as an additional crime, uh, edit, edit or amend it um, in the Rome statute, this is one way of doing it. We have thought a lot about it. Maybe you find it useful. This is what where, where our work really stopped and this is our contribution to the overall um, um, overall uh, initiative. Now, in terms of choices that we had, and, and we had many, now we had to look back at the long standing work on ecocide going back many, many years. Uh, I already mentioned Polly Higgins, who contributed significantly, but even before her uh, were academics, were politicians with different people, different initiatives, even the International Law Commission at one point looked into it, that had put forward different works, different proposals and suggestions. And we studied that very closely. In addition, also study, we studied um, national uh, proposals and national jurisdiction, where we already see that some states have included ecocide in their either constitutions or, or, or penal, uh, penal codes. So we had a rich background against we started off our discussions. And um, I just want to point out to four or five elements that in a way guided us, not necessarily explicitly, we didn't set out and said we have these parameters upon which we guide our work, but it was an, an understanding that was generated throughout the discussions over those more than six months. One uh, very important um, guiding element was that we were we wanted to present something that is realistic. We wanted to uh, present something that was not absolutely utopian and beyond anything that states had so far 
conceived in the realm of international law, be it international criminal law or international environmental law. We wanted to recognize existing language to the extent possible, but at the same time, of course, also pushing the envelope um, beyond uh, what, we, what we had. Uh, for that reason, we worked with familiar concepts uh, that we already partly find in the international in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, or um, um, advisory opinions judgments by the International Court of Just Justice. Um, that is one of the reasons why we did not uh, include elements like. Mother Nature or transboundary uh, planetary boundaries or a completely purely ecocentric approach or and I come back to this in a little later or uh, declaring any severe widespread or long term environmental harm to be a um, uh, crime of ecocide. We, we were very careful to not alienate states by what we put forward. And I think that worked out really well because I've heard from many um, panel members and I also make this experience myself. We've got a lot of feedback in particular from states where they said they appreciate the definition as something they could actually think about. They're still waiting, they're still <laughs> seeing what this leads to, but it wasn't something where they immediately said, oh no, this is beyond anything we would ever want to consider. So that was important for us that we did not put something forward that was actually detrimental to the likelihood of standing a chance to being adopted by the member states of the Rome Statute. Um, another element was that we, as I already said, we built on what was already there, we analyzed legal sources very, very carefully, and we loaned from existing international treaty law and custom, in particular in the definitions that you find in paragraph two of our proposed um, definition. A third element was that we were very careful, respectful, and conscious of the history, the very difficult negoci negotiation history of the existing crimes before existing international crimes. And that led to our choice that we did not consider amending them. We were worried that if you amend an existing crime, you actually open it up. Uh, and that you know, gives always a chance to water out, to downscale, to reopen negotiations that have been closed when those uh, crimes were defined and, and adopted. So we were out of deference, partly, but also because the existing crimes do not deal with environmental harm per se, they always have a human element to it. We decided to propose a fifth international crime, an alone standing international crime, not um, linked to the existing uh, crimes. I already mentioned that we were, um, it was very important for the panel to define the crime so as to capture pure environmental harm, harm that is not linked to any um, human uh, uh, impacts. Human impacts are not excluded, of course, if the environmental harm also leads to human uh, harm and suffering, that is of course captured in the definition as well. But it was very, uh, very important that we would also capture harm that is uh, happening to the environment per se, without any human or human group claiming that they also have been violated in any, uh, in any way or had to have any um, uh, damage. We had to make a choice here, and I'll come back to this in a while, of which kind of activity would lead to that harm. And it only applies to actions that are unlawful. For lawful activities, we have a different um, threshold and different uh, uh, modus of, of defining it. But for unlawful ac activities, pure environmental harm is included. What else? Um, as I said, we had very many possibilities and we considered probably not all of them, but very, very many of them and discussed at great length. One design choice, for example, is well, we had to decide whether to come up with that very general language that we now see in paragraph one. It's very general, very abstract. It potentially captures a lot of different situations and a lot of different perpetrators. 
or then that was the other choice was to come up with a catalog of very specific actions, things that we could consider would potentially fall under the um, uh, um, crime of ecocide. And we decided to go for the former, not for the later. We decided against a catalog of actions, partly because we could not possibly foresee all possible potential actions that could actually lead to severe um, and widespread or long-term environmental harm. Um, and also we didn't want to be prescriptive. We were fearing that if there were a catalog, those acts that were included were being, would be put a uh, um, uh, um, spotlight on, while things that we didn't mention could be interpreted as being excluded, even though it would have said inter alia, for example, but as long as you mention something, there is an, uh, a, a, like a, an, an opposite uh, expectation that what you don't mention is, is excluded. So we didn't want to go down that risk and didn't want to, to, um, to put into danger that we would not be able to capture something that may fall under it and it's just not listed in, in that catalog. Also, by keeping the definition general and abstract, we wanted this crime to develop in line with developing science, but also in line with developments in international law. Of course, not very much uh, uh, behavior is yet unlawful, especially when it comes to environmental destruction. But we would we wanted to be conscious that this may change over time, and that both treaty law, but maybe also developments in customary law, may render certain activities unlawful over time, and that is captured by that general um, uh, uh, definition. So we wanted to keep it dynamic and uh, evolving over time in line with legal and scientific development. Another choice was um, how to define the um, threshold for the environmental damage. That was maybe the one of the two elements which we used most time on. The threshold, we, it was very clear to us, it had to be a very high threshold for when environmental destruction could or should be considered an international crime that is of interest to the entire global community. Now, it was something that all of us agreed on would need to cross a certain level of severity. So severe environmental damage was something we very easily agreed on. What was a little bit more difficult was the question whether widespread or long-term would be conjunctive or disjunctive. And in the end, we agreed on a disjunctive solution where it's either widespread or long-term. And the reason why we went for that solution was that the conjunctive widespread and long-term was considered to have such a high threshold that it may never be, may, may never be reached um, in, in practice because we may have environmental destruction like killing the last rhinoceros. Uh, that is not widespread, <laughs> but it's definitely long-term, maybe severe. Or you have, um, you have other aspects which may be widespread, but not long-term, like uh, the pollution of a, of a river, a severe pollution that can be remedied, and it can be very uh, crossing a very large territorial scope, but it may not be um, long term. So we wanted to, to disconnect widespread and, and long term, uh, knowing that we would go against the existing definition in Article 2B4, uh, uh, 8 to be 4, I'm sorry, uh, in, in the uh, Rome Statute, but we took that chance. <laughs> at least the words were there, but they were disconnected, uh, at least widespread and, and long term. That was a very uh, important choice that, that we, we made. And the final aspect that I wanted to highlight, and that's something which we also used an enormous amount of time on, was that question of how to deal with acts that are legal. As I said, with illegal acts, that was not a difficulty. Illegal acts, we were all in agreement, they needed to be covered. And here, pure environmental damage is uh, part and parcel of the 
definition. But a lot of environmental destruction happens completely legally because we have laws both internationally that are not very specific and nationally that, that allow a lot of, of activities that do lead to environmental damage for several purposes. It could be you know, building a, a new motorway or even a hospital or any development project leads to environmental damage. It may be widespread, it may be long-term, it may definitely be severe, but is all that, can we all that capture by that definition? And we felt we could not for, for a behavior, but for acts that are legal, we had to find a different way of including them, but based on a proportionality test. And that's where the aspect of wanton came in that is also included in our definition where we say for acts that are legal, that are actually in compliance with national and international law, they can be uh, included in that definition. They can constitute an act of ecocide, but only if they are clearly excessive or the environmental damage is clearly excessive in relation to uh, economic um, or social um, benefits that are anticipated. So the idea is that the perpetrator is aware that there's an environmental damage. It, he or she, she is acting illegally, not, it's not an unlawful act, but just disregards the uh, disproportionality of the environmental damage to uh, any social and, and economic benefits. This was a difficult choice for us to make, but we felt this was the only way to also include um, acts that are in compliance with the law. But we also, we did this in the understanding that maybe the law will develop and that over time, more and more acts will become illegal and would be captured by the first part of the definition. And you don't have to go to the lawfulness and wantonness requirements in, in the second part of the definition. That's what I meant by keeping the definition alive and evolutionary and uh, uh, dynamic. So we were, we were conscious of, in comparison, all the other four crimes they uh, capture acts that are already illegal and elevate them to the, um, or criminalize them on the international level. And with regard to environmental destruction, we are not in the same spot. And we were conscious of not leapfrogging from purely lawful behavior to something that is suddenly an international crime. We thought this would be too much of a jump and it would be something that would alienate states when they would, would see this. Um, but we can, I'm happy to discuss this, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about it, but I just wanted to give some, some background uh, information of what we, what we did and what we uh, decided to do. One final aspect, which I found personally very interesting was I said, we, we provided a number of definition on the, in the second paragraph, of, of the, de um, uh, of the uh, proposed definition of ecocide, we provided definition on wanton, on severe, on widespread and long-term. So we borrowed here from existing definitions that we found in international law, but we also felt that we had to provide a definition on what the environment is. And looking through massive amounts of international law and commentaries, there was no such thing as a definition of the environment. So by the end of the day, we felt we, we had to provide something that includes everything, but also gives a scientific basis of what the environment is. And that's why we defined it as the earth with its different spheres, the biosphere, the cryosphere, atmosphere, and so forth, as well as outer space to the extent that it falls under the jurisdiction of states. Um, so this is this is new. Uh, that's something we, we um, came up with. We hoped uh, that would be helpful, maybe also in other contexts, to, to give a definition of the, the environment that is actually based on a, on a scientific understanding of what, what uh, the environment is, what the, what the, um, the different elements are. Um, but it is a very comprehensive definition of the environment, which includes everything um, within it, including humans and, and non-humans and, and um, the, the, as I said, the different spheres. Um, I think I'll stop here and um, I'm happy. I'm looking forward to Daryl's um, uh, 
talk and, and questions or critique. And I'm also very much looking forward to hearing from the audience maybe a little later on um, in, this, in this webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Voigt or Christina, if I may, a very interesting uh, overview, very clearly presented. I'd now like to uh, ask uh, Daryl, if I may, to uh, go ahead with his presentation. We'll have about 15 or 20 minutes for that. And then the screen will be open for others to ask questions and make comments. Please uh, go ahead, Daryl. And uh, thank you uh, to everyone uh, for coming to learn about Ecoside. I, um, I come at it uh, from a different background from Christina. My origin is international criminal law, and it's only in the last year or so that I've been um, maybe more than a year, two years, I guess, uh, looking at the environmental side of things um, with the Promise Institute Working Group and other projects. Um, I think what I can best help this group with, I think I'll talk about one, is ecocide a good idea for crime? And number two, some of the reasons why defining it is so difficult as, as Christina has already uh, uh, painted for us. Um, so uh, first of all, I should acknowledge there's arguments against uh, having a crime of ecocide. Uh, one, um, a lot of the environmental harm in the world today, it's actually created by individual actors such as each one of us, um, each of us making a small impact in our own way, um, rather than one big uh, criminal actor. Another argument against it is uh, responding to the environmental crises that we have right now, um, it's going to require a lot of complicated social reforms and trade-offs and certainly criminal law is not the first tool uh, for something like that. Um, nonetheless, I'm in favor of a crime of ecocide on balance and uh, I mean, here's why. I mean, um, as we all know, uh, right now, human beings, we are destroying our planetary habitat um, in dozens of ways and we're doing it rapidly on a large scale and a lot of it is irreversible and experts recognize this as a threat but even the global public there's surveys the global public recognizes this as one of the greatest global threats that we face um, it's a threat to the health and well-being of present generations and future generations of humans and of other species, right? So I think in my mind, ecocide meets the hallmarks that we look for for an international crime. Uh, it has impacts that transcend national boundaries. Um, national regulation is insufficient and it's really devastating. The scale of harm is devastating. Um, so I don't think we can leave this to national laws. National laws have been patchy, uneven, unenforced, often corrupted. Um, and they're causing harms that go outside of their borders. Um, and I'll tell you, one of my hopes for the crime of ecocide is lies in what we call the expressive function of criminal law. It's not even just that people are going to be scared and deterred by it. Um, I think what's interesting about ecocide is the idea, the message of it. Um, right now, in, in Canadian law, most environmental harm, it's a regulatory offense, which by definition is considered less serious. And the idea is to reframe um, destroying the habitat for all of humans and other species is not a minor offense. It actually belongs at the top. It's one of the most serious. So to stigmatize it in accordance with its gravity. And I think that observation answers one of the big uh, questions or concerns. Uh, uh, people sometimes say, why ecocide? Why this funny new word, ecocide? So eco, ecocide is eco, ecosystem, or oikos in Greek, plus side, which is to kill or to cut down, right? Destroying our oikos. And uh, the interesting thing about the ecocide label is surveys show it captures people's imagination, much more so than other phrases like environmental crimes against humanity. Um, another interesting thing about ecocide is it could help create a bit of a rebalancing. Um, criminal law tends to underfocus on crimes that are committed by the elites and by the wealthy people. Um, international criminal law is criticized right now for overfocusing on crimes of the global south. The ecocide is interesting because this is a crime where the authors tend to be uh, from the global north, but the impacts are felt in the global south. So one hope is that addressing ecocide um, can help correct some of the structural injustices and maybe create a little bit more of an equitable global system. And, you know, there's a movement 
which I sympathize with to reduce the amount of criminal law in the world. And I agree with that. But if anything is criminalized, ecocide should be, you know, at the top of things that are, are, are criminals. Um, and I don't suggest that ecocide is going to solve all of our environmental problems, but I think it could make a contribution in shaping uh, perspectives. And there's um, a bunch of scholars working in something called green criminology that are, are studying that. Now I'm going to switch with you for the what's the hard part though. So here's, in my case, I'm convinced we absolutely need a crime to deal with the worst polluters. But the hard part is how do you write it down? Like, how do you write this down? Um, winding back the clock, I was involved in the Rome conference making the international criminal court statute a long time ago. And what we did there is we took the worst prohibitions out of human rights law and humanitarian law. And we took the prohibitions that we all agree, this is this is the worst, it's something that deserves to be criminalized. And we can all agree that we're not going to do, you know, we all agree to condemn that thing, we're not going to do it. So when I first started working on ecocide, I thought, okay, same playbook, we'll just do the same thing we did before. We'll um, go look at the environmental law treaties and we'll take out the worst prohibitions. <laughs> and as a newcomer to environmental law, Christine is laughing at me because yeah, guess what? When I opened up the environmental treaties, uh, there weren't much in the way of prohibitions. Um, what environmental law treaties do is they state principles. Hey, uh, states, take this into account. Uh, make an action plan, plan bearing this in mind. Um, hey, let's have a cap and trading system. Um, uh, it, it, even when it seems to have a rule like um, ozone depleting substances, it has all kinds of exceptions like, oh, are you a developing country and you really need to do this to catch up then, right? So it, it, it's riddled with considerations of, of balancing. And that's why ecocide is the most difficult, interesting crime, because you have this challenge. Where international criminal law has succeeded, it's where we could identify and delineate something that most or all states can agree is terrible and we draw a circle around it and we say let's ban that and and, and you get you get something where there's a strong moral consensus and when we have that you have acceptance from states you have legitimacy you've got a critical mass of supporters and it can have an impact the challenge is where are we going to find this prohibition where are the bright lines um where's our moral consensus so the ingredients, there's different ways, as Christina has mapped out for us, uh, but the ingredients is going to be there's some kind of impact threshold, like Christina was talking about widespread long term severe impact, some sort of impact that warrants international concern. There's going to be some sort of mental element like um, awareness of that impact. But the hardest part is how do we now line this crime up with environmental laws? And this is hard because criminal law requires uh, that the conduct, the prohibited conduct should be relatively precise and knowable. I need to be able to know in advance is that thing over there a crime so I can avoid doing it. Whereas environmental law is more listing factors that have to be balanced, right? So how do I, how do, I do it? In domestic law, we solve it because we have an approvals process. Um, so at the approvals process there, they look at the factors and the considerations and they either give or withhold the license and they put conditions on it. Then the criminal law is doing environmental harm without the license or in violation of the conditions. And that system at the approval stage, we're doing the balancing and the factors, but then you have the clarity and foresight of, of criminal law because I know whether I do or don't have a license. International, that's not so easy. We don't have an international environmental impact board. And I'm not sure such a board would be a good idea because, uh, well, there's a few reasons why it might not be a great idea. So this is the hardest part. Uh, a lot of the commentary about the um, panel's definition, a lot of the criticisms were coming from an understandable place uh, where people say, why can't you just criminalize having a really big impact? Just that's the crime. Uh, have a big impact, big bad impact, that's the crime. Why do you have this worrying about what's illegal or legal? Why do you have uh, looking at social benefits? Um, uh, so what I'm gonna walk you through is the process that all of us who have worked on ecocide have had to swallow to understand why you need more than just impact. Um, so, I mean, right now there's, uh, I think about 7.8 billion human beings uh, on our planet. And every one of them needs food, clothing, and shelter as an absolute minimum. So every single one of them has an impact. They have, a, they have an impact by existing. You have an environmental impact by staying alive. Um, and I don't know, 7.8, maybe we have too many humans, but 
we have, they're there. So what are we gonna do? Um, so consider this, uh, consider a company that somehow collects food for hundreds of millions of people. That company is gonna have a huge ecological footprint because whatever the benefits are, it's multiplied by hundred million and the impacts are multiplied by a hundred million. So that company is gonna have a big environmental impact, even if it's taking the measures it should to try to reduce its harm. And that's why if we just were to simply criminalize having big impacts, then we've also criminalized coordinated activities to provide people with necessaries of life that have environmental impacts. Um, so once, you know, we're criminalizing your food supply chains, I just think it's bad policy. First of all, that's going to cause a lot of suffering of the vulnerable people. And ironically, the most perverse thing is that if we were to adopt that, it would increase pollution because now there's no more Loblaws. Every one of you is out shifting for your own to go get food, growing food, finding food, killing rats or something. Um, that's going to cause so much more waste. It's actually going to increase pollution. So um, uh, before I talk about environment, let, let me put another example is your computer. You're all watching this talk right now on a device. The device has all kinds of benefits, but that device. Uh, it's made of rare earth materials that were torn out of the earth. Then they were shipped, uh, causing pollution. They were assembled in a factory, and then they were shipped to you, causing more pollution. And the company that made your device made hundreds of millions of those devices. So you take their environmental impact of making your computer that you love, multiply it by 100 million, and you've got a, a, a very heavy environmental impact. Um, and this is why environmental law doesn't look only at impacts, it looks at um, what are the impacts? What are the benefits? Are you taking every measure you can to, to reduce the harms? It also looks at other factors like uh, developing countries need to eradicate poverty and so on, right? Uh, Inter-latitude equity. So I think it's correct that the crime is probably not just the impact. I think that's probably too simplistic. I think that would have bad effects. So um, um, I think that ecocide needs this ingredient of wrongfulness, some kind of irresponsibility, a failure to to regard environmental uh, principles. Um, I could even picture two companies. Um, company one has a bigger, it's more pollution, but um, it's doing something socially beneficial. It's feeding 100 million people. It's doing every measure it can to reduce harm. It's doing this much. Here's another company doing less pollution, but that company, it's, uh, it's wasteful, it's causing unnecessary pollution, maybe it doesn't have much social benefits as part of some corrupt scheme that's benefiting a few oligarchs. And uh, right, um, in, my, in my mind, company B is the worst one, the one who's having less of an impact. It's actually worse because it's so egregious. Um, so personally, but we can talk about this, I think ecocide has to be impact plus wrongfulness. And if we do that, if ecocide is focused only on the worst conduct, there's still going to be a lot for ecocide to do because there's a lot of projects in the world right now that are um, harmful, wasteful, not taking measures, they're corrupt, they might not have much in the way of benefits, there's a lot to do. So I'll just, I'll go kind of short. I'll just take three more minutes to kind of map out for you some of the solutions. And uh, to skip to the answer, there is no perfect, all the options, to add this wrongfulness element, they're all imperfect. There's no magic bullet. Every possible solution is criticizable. So we just have to pick which criticisms are we gonna get. Um, option one, we talk about it being unlawful in international environmental law. That's the first reflex of every international criminal lawyer. We like to have things that are illegal in international law. But the problem with that one, as Christina has already mentioned, is international environmental law doesn't actually concretely prohibit very much there's it just doesn't say it doesn't say don't go burn down your national parks it doesn't say that so uh there's problem one so then option two we could talk about whether it's unlawful in domestic law at first glance that's just um crazy to international criminal lawyers because um our habit is it doesn't matter if it was legal or illegal in domestic law. Are you, you know, are you killing thousands of people? It doesn't matter if it's legal, Ill, illegal, you can't do it. Um, but 
This, it could be warranted. This is different because environmental law is different because environmental law delegates to the national systems the job of considering these factors, pass law, make the decision. So the actual content, the rules are happening in the national sphere. So benefits of referring to it. One, you get clarity because people can know whether the thing they're doing is illegal or not because it's there in the domestic law. Number two, it's acceptable to states because I'm not penetrating their sovereignty. I'm actually saying, okay, you set the rules and then we'll punish the people who break them. Three, it's actually use, it's perfectly useful. Um, for example, uh, I think I read somewhere 95% of the deforest deforestation in the Amazon is estimated to be illegal under domestic law. So it captures a lot. Um, there are nonetheless downsides of that option. One downside is um, the different standards. If you have two countries and one has robust environmental law, the other one has shoddy, we're going to have a different rule. So some people understandably don't like that. And a state can kind of give itself a free pass by creating crummy domestic law, right? And then nothing would grab them. So probably we need something else, right? And uh, which is what the panel also did. They, they have the unlawfulness, but we also need an alternative. Um, so the other, uh, another possible option is this idea of you did disproportionate harm. So you did something that would fail any sane environmental impact assessment. And that's more or less what I think the panel definition is doing. I like it because it says, um, we're going to require economic actors to stop, think about what are the social benefits here? What are my impacts? What are my measures? Right? That kind of thing. Um, it does nonetheless get criticized from two different directions. The activists criticize it, saying, how can you possibly allow social benefits to ever be considered if someone's having a big and bad environmental impact? I kind of already gave the reasons why maybe it does make sense. So then the other criticism is going to come from the state side or from the businesses side. And it's meritorious, too. They're going to say that's too uncertain. It's too frightening. Um, what if I'm running a business? I'm doing something socially beneficial. I'm providing food or energy for people but it's high impact. So as a business person, I wanna know upfront, is this thing I'm doing a crime or not a crime? I wanna know upfront. And the problem is uh, the proportionality test is gonna allow the judges to look after the fact, look back, and then they're gonna decide that I'm gonna find out if it was a crime or not. So, you know, I get it. I get that concern that they, they're gonna want bright lines. But like I say, there's no perfect answer. Um, I like the panel approach because it combines two, it kind of works. I'll float for you for one minute, a couple other possibilities, but again, there's no magic uh, solution. One that I'm, I like the ideas of fraud and corruption. Um, the concepts of fraud and corruption are great in my mind because they're clear criminal law concepts, they're knowable, and they're condemned everywhere. And it's relevant because a lot of the worst environmental harms are correlated with corrupt or corruption and fraud in the process. So that could be one ingredient of a definition. Um, maybe there's something in human rights law. Um, although again, I've looked and it looks a little too nebulous, but maybe someday we'll find some bright line uh, in there. Um, another possible option is to have some kind of regulatory defense. And the way that would work is if you're a business and you went and you went through your environmental approvals process, you're entitled to rely on that process unless we can show something terrible about it. They didn't consult with indigenous groups. They didn't consider the factors they were obliged to. There was fraud, there was corruption, something like that. Um, that's it, I guess I'll stop there. So, um, I mean, personally, I'm in this quandary because I'm, I'm convinced that ecocide's a good idea. The worst pollution should be a crime. I also agree, understand that states and businesses are gonna want some definition with a bright line to it so that they know when they're transgressing and it's not easy to provide. No definition is going to give perfect clarity. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. Are we there with the panel definition or is some, maybe one of you is going to have, maybe one of you right now in this talk is going to make some suggestion and then we're going to get all excited and, and, and we'll fix ecocide right here today. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Darrow. Those were both very rich uh, presentations. Uh, lots of uh, ideas in, in my head that I'd love to share, but I'd like to prioritize any questions or comments from those who are attending. We have about uh, four, up to 40 minutes available for, for discussion. 
and I'd also gently encourage those who don't have their video on, the large majority who don't have their video on, to, to if you can, turn your video on. I just think it would uh, probably support a more uh, engaged uh, a discussion if that's possible uh, for you and allow our guests to have a better sense of how the uh, the room is reacting to the, the discussion. So I would gently nudge you to turn your video on, on if you can. So does anyone have any questions or comments with which uh, to begin the discussion? I see uh, Hannah's hand is up. Hannah, please go ahead. The screen is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you to both of the speakers for sharing, as well as the Nathanson Center for hosting. Um, since you've both been thinking about this longer than I have, I'm sure you have some ideas of who could, you know, some entities that may be responsible for committing this crime. So if I may be so bold as to ask, um, it's open to either of you, if you could bring someone, um, whether that be a state or a company, to the International Criminal Court for Ecocide, who would that be? Well, if I can chip in, it would be neither, um, because the International uh, Criminal Court has only jurisdiction over individual responsibility. So we're talking about individuals, not companies and not states. So we would have to find a, an individual, actually a person, who is committing uh, that crime. But that, that is something we could discuss. Who, who could that be? It could be the CEO of a company. It could be a state official. It, it could be a private person. Um, there, there are many possibilities um, by knowingly allowing, for example, big chunks of a rainforest in a big forest country <laughs> to be cut down by not enforcing the existing law. Um, that could be something that you know the head of state or the head of the environment ministry or whoever uh, ha has has some responsibility for, and the similar with with um, company um, directors or CEOs. But it could also be actually the person who carries, let's say, poison and chucks it into a river. Uh, that that is the same uh, individual responsibility, but it could be on on different levels. But I'm sure Dara has more to say uh, about this. Um, I agree about the individuals. And Hannah, were you looking for us to name like a specific historical? Oh, you are. Yeah, yeah, this is very interesting because I was considering having a policy of avoiding that just in case I don't know what my future is going to be in Ecoside. But um, let's wreck my future right now. Um, so, OK, I'm, I'm hesitant to give examples because to make point of finger, I would want to research facts to an extent that I haven't done. However, uh, just off the top of my head, uh, I think Chevron has been accused of doing some things in Ecuador that are pretty astonishing. Although that uh, the case against them, it's really complicated because uh, there's a lot of reasons undermining that judgment. But that 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 sounds pretty crazy what they got up to. Um, I worked a bit on a case again, not expressing opinions about ultimate liability, but it prima facie looks pretty bad to me. Is um, I've worked on something where it's in uh, Peru. There's a company, it has the mining rights in the town. There's a town, people live in the town, and there's a company doing open pit mining in the middle of the town. It's actually an amazing picture if you uh, Google it, uh, Sarah DePasco. Um, they're open pit mining in the middle of town, eating up the town, and toxic minerals are then coming out uh, into the drinking water of everyone in the village. I mean, how did that get approved? Um, Gulf of Mexico, I would need to know, hey guys, tell me what your plan, like what were the preventative measures in place here to stop this? Because that certainly seems to hit the impact threshold. So those are three off the top of my head without expressing an opinion about the final outcome because I would need more facts. Thank you uh, both. Uh, and thank you, Hannah, for the question. I, I don't see any other hands up right now, although all are welcome to comment. I, if, if I don't see any, I'll, I'll speak myself and uh, offer a couple of comments. Um, as uh, lawyers, as legal professionals, of course, we tend to look at legal tools to solve problems, uh, but we can uh, enter into the quagmires of uh, legalization of politics. And so I wonder if uh, 
the idea of a crime of ecocide is more in the nature of a political tool than a realistic uh, legal tool. Now, I say this partly informed by the context of my own knowledge about international economic law and international investment law. And in that landscape, I see the most powerful, most uh, highly enforceable international uh, laws, uh, bar none, uh, other than authorized use of force pursuant to the uh, UN Charter. And that's in the realm of uh, international investment law and international uh, investment treaty arbitration, which is available to protect only foreign investors against uh, regulatory conduct of states and has increasingly been used by fossil fuel uh, companies to attack a range of uh, environmental measures, including what I would see as the most pressing environmental concern, which is the threat of uh, global climate uh, disruption. So if we look at what states have done in international law, they've prioritized creating obstacles to state action to address probably the greatest environmental challenge in, in history of, uh, of humanity. Now, uh, what would a, a crime of ecocide entail, particularly an international crime of ecocide? I would suggest it sounds like an effort to add to the list of uh, horrific uh, criminal activity already prohibited internationally on criminal grounds to add to and, and kind of piggyback on whatever institutional apparatus might exist to use criminal law, the legal tool of criminal prosecution to attack those heinous acts. But does international criminal law really offer much salvation here? Uh, has Donald Rumsfeld faced criminal justice for the highest international crime, the crime of aggression, for the unlawful invasion of Iraq, uh, ex et cetera, et cetera. I don't see this as necessarily a promising legal pathway to confront the great political challenge that states have put far too much prioritization on protecting the business interests that are ultimately going to, you know, already have created unacceptable risk of collapse of organized human society within our lifetime. So I, I put that as, uh, aren't we clearly facing extraordinary limits to the uh, relevance of these legal tools, unless the purpose here is actually more of a political purpose and to rally people around the idea that states are not doing enough to protect against grave, extraordinary uh, environmental harms. Just a couple of comments. Feel free to respond if you wish. And if I see other hands up, I will, I will go to those people uh, uh, right away. Christina, would you like to go first or second? I'm happy to respond. Um, Gus, I, I think these are very, uh, very interesting and very relevant reflections that you share with us. And, and you're definitely also very right in, in what you're saying. Uh, I don't think that criminal law can save the world, neither from crimes against humanity or aggression, nor from destroying the uh, natural basis of our life. It is something that is kind of the last resort, especially when it comes to the international criminal um, level, uh, where we, we can only hope that it has some deterrent effect, but I don't think it can solve the underlying systemic uh, problems and challenges that, that we're facing. They need to be resolved elsewhere. They need to be resolved to treaty law, to national implementation, to changes in consciousness, to changes in how uh, who we elect as our <laughs> politicians as our government uh, and here of course a lot of hope is put on on younger people doing better which is kind of unfair but that's the last hope we have um, but but I think what this uh, exercise on ecocide the definition the discourse around 
can achieve is a change in consciousness or at least a contribution to that mental change of how to look at the most severe environmental destruction, considering that it could potentially be a criminalization or criminalized on the international level as the most severe international crimes can stimulate um, a re-evaluation of our values and then our consciousness. So that, that's something that I definitely, definitely, definitely hope. And in that way, it is also a political tool, but it's also um, a, a tool to, to speak to, uh, to people, to, 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 to stimulate that change in consciousness. One last word what I'd like to offer is on this wantonness requirement because does you very rightly point to the fact that a lot of environmental impact deep impact is legal and it is even protected through these bilateral investment treaties or regional free trade agreements that we are seeing which do protect certain um, investment interests um, but what the the definition actually does with the requirement of wanton is saying yes some of this stuff, some of these actions may well be legal or they are legal, but if you recklessly disregard that the environmental damage is excessive in relation to social and environmental benefits. So two, two thresholds here, you recklessly disregard it. So basically said, I don't care. And it's excessive, uh, then it is captured even if it is legal, even if it may be protected by bilateral investment and treaty. Uh, and this aspect isn't yet really deeply analyzed by, by lawyers, what the message actually is, what the impact could be by this definition. It's, it's like latent lying there and it has, been, uh, it has been drowned by all this criticism, but the, the massive potential that lies there is something that I, I would suggest that scholars put more <laughs> attention to. Thank you. Um, I'll, uh, in a similar vein, uh, I first of all I agree with Gus for correctly raising the question about, um, uh, you know, the tendency of lawyers to look at law as the solution and, um, uh, you know, as, as if we're all holding hammers and we're looking for nails and um, uh, we're then going to quibble amongst ourselves about the definition and in the end, uh, the crime is probably going to play a pretty small role. So I agree with all that. In addition, there is a irony of our current legal system in international law, it's positive law. So it means we have to convince states to adopt it. So I'd like to see a crime of uh, dragging your feet on climate change, right? That would be a fantastic crime. No way our state's gonna make that a crime because they're, they're doing it, right? So uh, I agree. Um, nonetheless, uh, the benefit uh, I see uh, and Gus gestured at this already and Christina said it, but it, it's, it's not just the legal assertion, it's a social assertion. Um, that ecocide is a crime. So for even whether, regardless of whether it gets passed in law, the social meaning uh, is, I think, important. Even if we don't succeed, just that idea that um, causing that kind of harm on that kind of scale is not business. It's not acceptable business. It's it's a, it's a, it's a social, socially uh, we recognize a crime. Um, yeah, and then in terms of uh, what can we the actual downstream impact of international law. You know, we build international law one thin little web at a time and then another web and another web. And we hope eventually that with enough of these threads, each of them may be weak on their own, that together the threads can be strong. Um, but I myself don't think that the International Criminal Court having control of the crime of ecocide is going to be the big solution. Uh, what I'd like to see is um, Ecocide gets adopted in the laws of 120 countries is my uh, goal. Uh, so personally, I'm not pinning it all on the ICC as such. Thank you both uh, very much for those responses. I see Barnali's hand is up and I'd also encourage everyone else, please don't be shy. Let's talk about how this relates to your own research or what you're studying in class. Please don't, don't feel uh, intimidated at all to, to participate as well I'd welcome any questions or comments at all. Barnali, please go ahead. So thanks very much. And thanks very much um, to both of you. That was a really um, fascinating talk from both of you. Um, I think I just want to go back one second. And, um, and maybe you mentioned at the beginning, Christina, and I kind of missed it. But I was just wondering, why did the panel think about ecocide as a criminal issue from the get go? And why wasn't it thought of as a civil issue? And so I'll just give you my context, right? So I 
um, work on issues of uh, corporate responsibility. And I, my work really looks at, you know, these due diligence initiatives, kind of the things that Daryl was kind of referring to. And I don't know if that's what he meant by when he said he wants Ecoside to be nationally uh, adopted in each country. But what we look at is that we have pretty much given up that any um, country in the world will hold a corporation responsible outright. And so we are now going through the lesser step of coming up through due diligence initiatives. So the idea being, we know that you did something really bad and it was really terrible. And I don't know, for example, you destroyed the environment, but did you at least have the proper procedures in place to prevent that from happening at the get-go? And I know that it's not at all the same as ecocide. And that's why I'm really um, sort of very interested in this topic, because of course this criminalizes and a lot of the things that, you know, that Daryl mentioned, the expressive function of criminal law, uh, the social meanings that's being addressed that shows that how important this is. But I was just wondering why the panel even focused on criminal law at the get-go. And the, re the other reason is, is that, of course, there's a, I mean, and I don't know anything about criminal law, but there's a mens rea requirement, right? Which makes it much more difficult. And the second thing is, is that when I read your definition, it said that it would be implemented under the Rome statute. And as I said, you know, I work on corporate uh, issues and I recall that under the, from the negotiations from the Rome statute, that corporations were not being recognized as entities under the Rome statute, like that there was this discussion and, the, and many of the European countries rejected it. So now, and then I was kind of surprised when Daryl said like, there'll be this CEO that will come and that the CEO will be now held responsible under the Rome statute. But isn't that sort of circumventing the whole basic idea of corporations not being responsible under the Rome statute? Anyways, thanks. Christina, do you want to go first again? Oh, go ahead, Daryl. Um, let's, I'll do the easy one first, actually. Um, the fact that the IC, you're right, everything you said is right. Um, the ICC doesn't prosecute corporations per se, but that doesn't mean it can't go after act. Uh, the ICC goes after human beings. So the whole idea of international criminal law was let's stop focusing only on state responsibility. So there is still state responsibility. The state has to pay compensation for the bad stuff it does, but we're going to also punish the individuals. I think it's going to be the same with corporations. Um, so the ICC doesn't look at the corporate person per se, but that doesn't mean that all corporate activity is exempt. Uh, I think we would punish the 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 people, the human beings in the company that made the decision. I, I think that they are uh, absolutely fair game for international criminal law. Um, but, but so yeah, before I, before you get going though, how do you determine that? So under and I'm a little out of practice with Canadian criminal law, but there's that heart, um, hands and feet theory or whatever it is, right? Um, you guys can't figure out under domestic criminal law, whether it's the CEO, the director who are, who's responsible for that. So you hold the entity responsible. Mm. How, how the heck is that gonna happen under international law? Hmm. I mean, um, we have the same problem with states. Uh, who's responsible? Is it the stormtroopers or is it the masterminds? Right? Who who is responsible? Answer both. Um, so the the so uh, you're right, but I think internet. I think we haven't we haven't had as much of a problem with that in international criminal law. Um, um, we're we. And we've we've had to penetrate state structures and armed group structures, so um, I th I think it's I think that part is doable. Um, but I was excited about something else you talked about due diligence, and I think in the end, again, Acoside's not going to be the silver bullet that you know solves everything. But I I'm super interested in the idea of. Uh, working alongside with other initiatives. What's going to eventually, I talked about webs or threads with gas, right? They're, we're just laying down one thread. Here's a thread of crime of ecocide. There's another thread. How about due diligence has to include environmental impacts, right? So they can all work, work together. Um, one of the um, criticisms I remember once reading is international criminal law sucks up all the oxygen for itself. And I don't think that's true um, because uh, international criminal law, uh, when it says, um, uh, this particular act over here is a crime against humanity that activates all other, all other, lots of other kinds of interest in the same, sorry, I'm rambling. It activates lots of other kinds of interest in the same problem. So um, we could have the crime of ecocide, which then might not detract from, but fuel an interest in do, you know, adding environmental due diligence and so on. So I kind of think these things can all work as threads in a comprehensive whole. Sorry, I took so many words. Um, I pick up on on the uh, 
the first question, uh, Van Ali, about what, why did the panel go straight into criminal law and did not consider anything else? Well, it's basically that was our mandate. That was what we were <laughs> asked to do. And that's what we found challenging enough. And as I said, we were 12 lawyers with very different backgrounds. Uh, and it was very good that we had a very concrete mandate <laughs> and that was, you know, provide us with a definition that could be used potentially to, um, to uh, uh, for an amendment to the, the Rome Statute. I mean, this alone was, was our, our mandate. Uh, we haven't really talked about, you know, what would happen next or what could happen next. I mean, the, as I said initially, that didn't, this definition is a, a suggestion, a proposal, it's a tool, an instrument that states can pick up or they can let it sink around um, but what would be required now if if you know if this would to, to kick off the process was you know it only needs one state to send a proposal to the UN, UN secretary general in New York uh, with a request that this should become a, a you know a negotiation topic and then needs a majority of states to agree on that would be something they want to negotiate and then it needs a three-quarter majority to adopt it and then if it's adopted as an amendment it's only becoming binding on those states that actually ratify the amendment which by the end of the day maybe very few, but this is this would be the process that we're looking down the line um, at, and and we don't know if it's happening and if if so, how long it would take. Uh, but in terms of why we only looked at criminal law, it was just that was what we were asked to do. Many of us do different things at the same time, working on um, um, activism and and social um, uh, socialization of this concept and many other things as well. Um, we actually did discuss due diligence quite a lot, which was interesting because due diligence came in in our discussion about lawfulness, unlawfulness standards that we have in international environmental law. But also we just say unlawful. We don't say under which law. It could be unlawful under human rights law. It could be unlawful under I don't know, um, economic law, um, different. We just say unlawful and we don't even say on which level, international level uh, or, or national. We just leave it <laughs> very broad. Uh, but due diligence was something we, we considered as a as um, a qualifying element before we then went to wantonness, but it was in the realm. But when we considered due diligence, we did not consider it only as a procedural requirement that you would have complied with procedural requests of carrying out environmental impact assessment and so forth. For us, due diligence also contains substantive uh, requirements to do the best you can to apply all appropriate measures at hand to the, the utmost, which is not only procedure it is also a substance but by the end of the day we we, we let it <laughs> where it is and where it's being developed and i appreciate your work on on due diligence for to, for companies but we we did we did play with it for for a while mens rea uh, we haven't talked about this objective element yet at all and it might be getting a little late here but there uh, was a whole discussion about the 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 mens rea, this objective element that we put in there, we require knowledge. In our understanding, it was knowledge of the damage, knowledge in the understanding that you actually knew or you could have known by using the publicly informa uh, available information, data, scientific reports, whatever is out there, you could have known that your act by, you know, chucking this ton of toxin into the river or by cutting down forests, um, that you actually that this leads to an environmental damage. So it's it's actively known or could have known in terms of making use of publicly available information. So it's a dolus um, eventualis. You take it into account um, and and you do nothing about it really. Um, but we, as I said, we haven't discussed the, the, the this uh, element either. But I'm I'm happy to to if there are more questions about it to to explain in more detail what what our thinking was also on on mens rea. I could add in a new controversy uh, if that helps. Shall I? Let's let's just take a, a moment to let the thoughts percolate okay. in people's minds in case someone gets over the hurdle of, of putting their hand up to say something that's on their mind. You know, there's there's lots of people on the call. I don't want to uh, everyone to feel they just have to remain in listening mode. Anyone, anyone? Jacob, thank you. Please go ahead. <laughs> no worries. Thank, thanks everyone for your time today. Um, I guess my question was when I, when I was listening to you guys discuss sort of the drafting process, um, if you looked at 
what domestic laws sort of exist with regard to ecocide or economical damage? And if so, um, you know, what you gleaned from that in terms of the, the impact of those laws, the ability of those laws, you know, to be enforced and, and sort of just, I, I know we're kind of changing the page from, from men's reign and, and all of that, but just what the impact of any domestic laws, and I'll, you know, I'm not familiar with them, so I'll put that out there, but, but what impact those had in the drafting process and, and anything you learned from the state's domestic experiences in this sort of realm? Uh, Christina, do you, do you like first or second? Let me go first because, <laughs> because we worked in it. Christina, and, and then we'll come back to Daryl. And if you want to, to add your additional point, then Daryl, please feel free. Most, most certainly. Um, well, we did, of course, consider domestic laws and what, in gen more in general, what role should they play? If there were an activity that was prohibited under domestic law, was maybe even you know, criminalized under, inter under domestic law, international law, what role should that play? in our consideration of elevating that kind of activity to an international crime. Um, of course, we didn't look at 123 <laughs> different member states national legislation that would have been a little bit too much and it's not necessary for the reasons that Daryl mentioned earlier on. But when we discussed this, this, uh, this uh, distinction between unlawful and lawful acts that then had to be wanton, we definitely considered um, uh, uh, domestic law. But one interesting exercise that we did at one of our meetings with all our 12 lawyers that we asked ourselves, or we were asked prior to the meeting to come up with an example, with a potential hy hypothetical example of what kind of act we as panel members would consider could fall under that definition of ecocide. And that was a very, very interesting discussion where we had 12 uh, fairly different situations. And we always asked ourselves, would that be unlawful under domestic law? Would that be unlawful under international law? And if not, could we still somehow capture it? And if so, how? So that was a very um, impactful thought experiment that, that, we, that we did. And I, I can only encourage you <laughs> to do it yourself, you know, think about what would you think would capture, would be captured or should be captured by an international crime of ecocide if that ever uh, goes goes forward. Um, yeah, Jacob, it's a great question. Um, um, I, I think Christina has crushed it there, but uh, um, um, I, I looked also at domestic laws. Could, does someone have a solution here that we can copy? Um, there are a bunch of uh, countries, mostly former Soviet countries, that actually have ecocide in their uh, criminal codes, but it's not very thought out definition, so they turned out not to be that helpful. Um, then for most systems, it wasn't something we could directly copy because um, they all assume a regulatory process where you did or didn't get an approvals in. So I was really looking, is there anyone in the world who you know, does this ex post facto evaluation of the justification and uh, there wasn't much. Uh, there was, uh, I think in Australia, it's an aggravating factor. Uh, if they look at it and said, oh, by the way, the social benefits and the, and the, and the harms didn't line up, it's like an aggravating factor. But uh, yeah, uh, the best to take out a domestic law is just little pieces, an idea about causation, an idea about mens rea, but no one had this model that we could use. Thank you both. John, I see your hand is up. Please go ahead. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, John. Yeah, I've got. I, I, I've been debating whether to weigh, weigh in because I get very grim when I think about these topics. Um, the I, I, I confess I struggle with the word ecocide. Um, the, um, I mean, I, I think oikos is a Greek word meaning house, which in this concept we could expand a dwelling or habitat, of course, and the whole point is that it's not the living thing that lives in the, in the habitat, it's the, it, 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 the habitat itself isn't alive, it's the, it's the thing that lives in the habitat, right, so kill, killing a habitat just doesn't, the, the metaphor isn't right, <laughs> um, so um, there, that's that's the difficulty and i suppose in terms of destroying ha habitat the the domestic equivalent you know apart from arson which is specific to fire it's mischief right if i bulldoze somebody's house the charge would be mischief right 
Uh, but that doesn't that that doesn't resonate with most people as a public relations exercise, you know, creating an international crime of mischief, right? <laughs> right. Um, so um, there, there, there's all kinds of conceptual problems, and then and then whose habitat do you worry about, right? Like, is, are you going to make it a crime to tear down a bird's nest or even worse, a rat's nest out of your own property, right? Um, but that's destroying somebody's habitat, right? If you include animals, which of course we would. I um, mean, bulldozing somebody's house would pretty clearly be a crime, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, I just see all kinds of conceptual and definitional problems before you get anywhere. Um, and, and then there's the whole question about, you know, the, the, what the Rome statute does. And of course, Canada, you know, makes all those horrible things, domestic crimes, thinking that, can't, that nobody, no Canadian will ever be prosecuted by the international court. And of course, a whole lot of countries have adopted the statute on that basis. Uh, and, um, you know, countries have adopted it, you know, that after a revolution, they don't have the resources domestically to take care of the, the, the remaining opposition. So they might adopt it thinking they're going to get help from the International Criminal Court. Uh, but of course, a lot of countries in Africa have come to regret that approach because it gets turned against themselves, right? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, there, there's a lot of problems with the Rome statute that occur to me as well. And, 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 and when I'm at my very most grim, I think that, that you, know, you know, when I watch the re recent discussions in you know, COP26, I think international cooperation is probably not the way to go. There's got to be some relaxation of the crime of aggression. Because, because what's going if, to, if, if, if a few powerful countries start to take climate change seriously, what they're going to do is not going to, you know, beggar themselves. What they're going to do is take all, all the measures they can to reduce most of the other economies of the world, you know, to the Stone Age while protecting their own, right? If, if they decide that climate change has to seriously be dealt with, and no, no doubt they will figure out a way to do that in a non-genocidal and environmentally friendly way. But that ultimately is the way to deal with climate change is to destroy the economies of probably more than half the earth. Right. So I, I get very grim when I think about this stuff. And I don't know what you're going to do with that rant, but feel free to weigh in. Fine, you, you promised you said you were going to get grim and then, oh, my God, <laughs> it got so grim. Um, just to, I'll start on the just the term. Um, so um, just to defend the term itself. Um, so you're right, but side is sedere, which is not just kill, but to cut or hew down. And um, that's literally what we're doing. We are cutting and hewing down our, our uh, ecosystem. So I think the term is, work, uh, is okay. When I talk about habitat, I don't just mean habitats in the narrow sense. We talk about preserving. I mean, we live on this one little planet, the pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan called it. We live on this one little band of the planet, actually. And that's what I mean by the habitat. It's that thing we need to live. Um, but Christina, can you uh, help on the bigger picture? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I understand uh, grimness. I, I completely do. I, I personally chose the other way. Um, I, I, I try to be optimistic. Um, but it's sometimes hard and I can relate <laughs> to the sentiment of Ingram. I just spent two weeks in Glasgow and then came back on, on Monday. Um, and, and of course, I mean, we're not there yet, but, but there were also some optimistic signs and international cooperation. It's slow, it's painstakingly slow and too slow, but it is indeed moving forward. Um, but that's a different avenue to, to international criminal law as we discussed earlier on um, criminalizing certain behavior that leads to severe environmental destruction is something that is not captured by these international discussions. It's outside that, that realm and could, but it could have an influence. It could have some you know, kind of motivational gust <laughs> into, the, into the negotiations if, if, we are, if we are lucky. But uh, I, I don't know where, where to take it from, but I think um, it is good to be angry, but I'm not sure it helps us so much. I think it's more helpful to try to think about ways out of this mess and not just wait for young people to step up, but really to engage in, in constructive uh, uh, thinking and ways forward. And this is one element. There are many others, uh, but ecocide is one little aspect to try to move the envelope 
a little bit and change that overall thinking, the consciousness, the social understanding or contract or whatever we want to call it. But there are others, there are rights of nature, there are human rights to a clean, clean, safe and healthy environment, sustainable environment. There are many different um, um, options that are moving forward. And I guess by the end of the day, it's probably the sum of all of them, law, uh, economics, uh, social uh, aspects together that hopefully get us out of that mess where we currently are. Thank you very much, uh, Christina and Daryl and, and everyone who's participated. Our time is winding down, though I see Alexander has put her hand up. Let, let me reserve a few more minutes for Alexander. I think we, we've got that time. So Alexander, I don't want to deter you. Please go ahead. I just, I was uh, ruminating on the idea of when an, uh, legal, an act that is legal becomes wanton and therefore um, a, the proposed definition becomes applicable. In particular, I was thinking about the issue of the ozone layer and the use of CFCs, which uh, following the Montreal, uh, I think it was Montreal protocol, like the use of CFCs absolutely plummeted because there was this fantastic uh, replacement for it, which were F HFCs, which had a much less serious impact on the ozone layer. But now, uh, you know, 10, 20 years out, we're seeing that while the effect on the ozone layer wasn't very uh, as significant as CFCs, it has like, 10,000 times the heating potential of uh, carbon dioxide. And so people are starting to kind of get on the wagon of, well, maybe we should phase these out too. Like scientists are aware of it, they've published their findings, but there's a lot more inertia now because there's a lot, industry is just growing at a much more rapid rate than it was at the time of the Montreal Protocol. So it, I guess just in terms of ecocide, the science is always evolving and the tests that people are running and the reports that and findings that they're making are constantly changing. Is there kind of, I guess, maybe like a threshold at which point something becomes wanton? It, because I know part of the issue in particular with the COP26 was the fact that they scaled back some of their ambitions and they're taking more time to do, like, is there a point at which it becomes wantonness? Yes, that's kind of, sorry, it's a half-formed question, but I thought I'd ask it. No, it's actually a really spot-on question and a really relevant one. And, and also one <laughs> we didn't answer because we didn't set a very, you know, concrete, specified, um, quantifiable or measurable threshold. We said it's reckless disregard. Um, for, for, for excessive damage compared to environmental social benefits. But it is those these, these normative terms that would need to be filled with meaning through praxis, practice or you know, academics trying to define where this actually could lie. Um, but we couldn't do this in this particular definition because as I said, we needed to keep it um, general. But this is something that you know, in, in common law systems, courts have always done through developing precedent and case law and you filled little bits and pieces with more specific meaning or you have more, more specific rules in, in civil law. Just one word on, on, on HFCs, there's the Kigali amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which was adopted in, after the Paris Agreement in 2016. And it actually does address the phase out of HFCs because they are strong greenhouse gases. So just, just a little <laughs> thing there. It is not taken care of, but it is in an international environmental treaty and an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. Daryl, would you like to offer a, a further concise uh, response in the time we have left? Uh, no, that's okay. Okay, wonderful. So look, we have I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, especially uh, Christina and Daryl. I would like to leave on a positive note uh, to stress that uh, we have always a choice of many, many avenues to respond to a problem as large as even climate disruption alone. And this is, of course, just one. And one of the roles of uh, academics and, and the people who do academic or research is to test out options and try to provide options that are kind of on the shelf for the day when political decision makers find them useful. Here, a definition of ecocide uh, is along that path from my point of view. 
for states that are interested in pursuing this avenue, they'll have the benefit of the definition. And for states that are not interested, it may have the benefit of causing them a little bit of lingering anxiety about their own uh, failures to act. Also, I'd like to stress I, I, last week I heard on the radio, there's a lot of uh, climate anxiety among young people. And just to be clear, it, it exists among middle-aged people uh, like myself too. And uh, I find that um, the way to get at that is just to accept that we can only affect what we can control or have some significant influence over. And But we also all have agency and we can all take steps within our respective domains. And for those of you associated with Osgood, I would uh, highlight that a uh, working group to advise the Dean was recently created and announced that our faculty council, I'm chairing it and its purpose is to make recommendations on implementing one of the focus areas of Osgood strategic plan, which is to respond to society level crisis. Here we're speaking particularly of le learning lessons from the pandemic crisis uh, and preparing for and responding to the crisis of uh, climate disruption that is that is building around us. So uh, I hope uh, examples like that will point to the opportunities for all of us to exercise agency. Even just putting your food waste in the compost instead of the garbage keeps some of those dirty molecules out of the uh, the atmosphere. And every molecule out of the atmosphere buys that little bit of time for the scientists to uh, to maybe we hope save us in a generation or so. Thank you all very much for participating. I'd like to offer a final word to Barnali as our as our ultimate host. Uh, Barnali, any last comments? This was a wonderful discussion from my point of view, and I'm very grateful to Christine and Daryl. No, oh, that's it. That's all for me. Just thank you very much, um, Professor Boyant, Professor Robinson. Um, we learned a lot from you today, and um, we hope that we can take this discussion of uh, ecocide that we've learned from you and, you know, create the web that Daryl has proposed to put in, whether it nationally or internationally, really to fight climate change. So thank you very much. And thanks, Gus, too. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.